Okay, hi everyone, welcome. My name is Maureen Ryan. I am the Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And today we have, um, we're joined by two incredible scholars. We're gonna talk to Thea Rio Francos and um, about her new book, which has just been published, Resource Radicals from Petronationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador. And she's gonna be joined in conversation by George Chicarello Mar. And I'm just gonna say a couple of programmatic things um, and then I will get out of the way and let the fun begin. Um, if you are joining us on YouTube Live, which I assume all of you are, you can leave comments at any time in the chat and um, you can put them there. We're gonna get to Q&A at about 30, 35 minutes um, into the event. So we will moderate from that YouTube Live and bring it into the discussion here. Um, feel free to write down whatever you'd like. Um, also, we're gonna go for a, a little bit over an hour, uh, probably till about um, 4.40 Central Time, just in case people are curious about that. And um, we, we hope you have a, a good time. So I'm gonna turn it over to the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies, Richard Grusin, uh, to introduce our speakers. Thanks, Maureen. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce people and let uh, Gio handle the more extended uh, introduction. But I wanna welcome folks to Fall Fridays at C21, which is our response to um, life, virtual life, uh, or life in the virtual academy, I guess you could call it. Um, and I'm really uh, excited finally to get a chance, at least virtually, to meet uh, Theoria Francos. I've followed her work for a while, both uh, the work on Ecuador and uh, the book she wrote, uh, Planet to Win, or co-authored Planet to Win, about why we need a Green New Deal, which articulates, I think, a really fantastic uh, vision of what an alternative uh, energy and social future, social political future could look like. So it's really great to have her here. Uh, I'm also happy to welcome back uh, Gio Chicarello Mar. Um, Gio has been, by my count, um, an invited guest at C21 three times since I arrived in 2010. And I think that may put him in the lead. Um, I don't know that we're, we're uh, counting or it's a contest, but um, he's uh, been here on more than one occasion and we always uh, enjoy his participation and are happy to welcome him back. So uh, with that, I'll just turn it over to Gio. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm incredibly glad and honored to, to be here to discuss uh, Thea Rio Franco's book, Resource Radicals. Huge thanks to the C21 for, uh, for organizing this event um, and for giving us a space to talk about what is really an incredibly important book. Um, I don't come uh, to y'all as an objective observer or, or neutral party uh, when it comes to this book. Um, not only am I the, the co-editor of the, the book series that it was published in Radical Americas at Duke University Press, go pick up all the books. I believe there's a 50% sale going on. Um, take advantage of that if it's, if it's still happening. Um, but this is a book that I was in a way stalking uh, before it was even anywhere near a book when it was a dissertation and what I knew the work that, that Thea had been doing um, on extractivism, neo-extractivism and critiques of extractivism in, um, in Ecuador. Um, and part of the reason that I was so interested in, in pursuing the book and eventually getting it published in this series is, well, there were, there were a few reasons. One is that the Radical America's book series was uh, formulated as a, a reaction and a response to what I understood to be, and my, my co-editor Bruno Bastille's understood to be a sort of overly pessimistic tone in Latin American studies and cultural studies that could not and was not keeping pace with real events on the ground, right? And so Thea's book, um, which is an engaged and optimistic, stubbornly optimistic book, um, is one that, you know, that was incredibly suited to um, that series. Uh, but also as someone who works on Venezuela, um, you know, doing work in Venezuela where the question of extractivism um, was resolved in a very different way long ago and where there's really no 
question of whether or not Venezuela would extract oil for radical uh, ends, um, I was sort of looking westward toward the Andean region where these critiques were much sharper, um, and yet which they took in uh, you know, uh, often caricatured form, whether it was on the side of, of governments upholding extraction or whether it's on the side of movements with a kind of knee-jerk rejection of all extraction. Um, at this, you know, I, I saw Thea, and, and this is what you will find when you look into the book, um, is an incredibly balanced, um, nuanced account of the tension, not necessarily a resolvable tension, but the tension between uh, what she calls anti-extractive discourse um, and radical resource nationalism, both of which persist, both of which have, um, have virtues, um, and yet which have uh, led to some of the tensions uh, you know, that we see um, in the present. Um, that dog in the background is really just part of the, you know, the, the atmosphere uh, here. Um, and so it's, it gives me really just huge amounts of pleasure to welcome a comrade, to welcome a friend. Um, Theo Rio Francos is an assistant professor of political science at Providence uh, College. Were that not enough, she's also Andrew Carnegie Fellow um, and simultaneously Radcliffe Institute Fellow. Um, her work focuses on resource extraction, uh, renewable energy, climate change, green technology, and social movements. Um, not only in Latin America, we should insist, but of course in the US and globally as well. Alongside resource radicals, uh, her essential text co-authored A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal um, is something that everyone should be checking out. And Thea has been an active uh, you know, participant in debates around, um, you know, eco-socialism and the Green New Deal, um, posing a radical vision for a Green New Deal, um, even against attempts to defang and water down uh, that vision in the presence. She's a member of the Democratic Socialists of America and serves on the steering committee for the organization's eco-socialist working group. Um, please join me um, in welcoming electronically and without the, the applause that we would have otherwise the Rio Francos to talk about uh, resource radicals. Wow, thank you so much um, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm just gonna sort of dive right in here because I wanna have as much time for as possible for conversation with, with Gio as well as with, with the audience. And I'm gonna start this book event in a way that is uh, idiosyncratic for me, which is by reading a bit of the book itself. I think in a way that, that situates some of the dilemmas, um, but also the novelty of this particular type of critical discourse and social movement strategy around extractivism in Ecuador, in the Andes and in the global South um, in, in general. Um, so I'm gonna read, it'll be a little less than 10 minutes, just so you know, you can relax in your seats and then Gio will open up with some broader questions. In the wake of the constituent assembly and anti-mining law protest, extractivismo discourse circulated through the conduits of an activist communicational infrastructure in meetings, texts, public events, and informal conversations, indigenous environmentalists, anti-mining and anti-oil activists crafted strikingly similar narratives. When Amanda Yepes of the radical environmental group Acción Ecológica took the stage in a June 2012 debate over mining in the northern city of Ibarra, she recounted a sweeping history of extractivism, dating it to 1534, the year of the Spanish conquest of Quito and the moment of its quote, insertion into the world market. Then sped ahead through the colonial period and independence, noting the continuity of the export oriented accumulation model that was only reinforced when the first barrel of oil was extracted in Ecuador in 1972. The nascent large scale mining sector was just one more link in a never ending chain. Even within this sweeping account, for anti-extractive activists and intellectuals, the Correa administration was the most extractivist regime in Ecuador's history. This reveals the extent to which the concept had become the linchpin of critiques made by Latin American leftists. These critiques range from reproaching pink tide governments for sacrificing stated commitments to indigenous rights and environmentalism on the altar of resource extraction, to making the stronger case that the political economic logic of quote leftists, for this too is called into question, administrations was fundamentally quote extractivist. According to those that espoused the latter, Correa's discourse of post neoliberalism, combined with the increase in social spending under his administration, merely ideologically legitimated the consolidation of extractivism. 
As polarization between the Korea administration and oppositional social movements exacerbated, anti-extractivism and opposition to the government became in increasingly intertwined and interchangeable. The first three resolutions adopted at the National Indigenous Federation's Assembly in June 2013 show the tight link between an anti-Korea stance and an anti-extractive stance. Quote, maintain our political autonomy and independence from the government of President Rafael Correa. Quote, maintain the unwavering struggle against the extractivist model. And quote, declare Ecuador free of large scale mining, especially in sources of water and watersheds. As extractivismo discourse and opposition to Correa consolidated, indigenous environmental and local anti-mining and anti-oil groups acted to obstruct every phase of what they now saw as an interconnected extractive model. Extractivismo discourse highlighted how the environmental effects of extraction travels to locales distant from oil or mining projects. This occurs through the physical infrastructure that extraction requires, highways, tunnels, pipelines, tailing basins, which causes widespread deforestation as well as through the media of air and water, which transport contaminants. But seen through an anti-extractive lens, this model was just as importantly a set of political economic relationships between points of hydrocarbon or mineral extraction and points of their consumption, whether in the form of burned fossil fuels or the redistribution of resource rents as social investment. In the view of anti-extractive, Act, extractive activists, these pathways were carved out by the constant egress of crude oil or semi-refined copper and the constant ingress of dollars to affected communities, whether to, to build schools or pay off local officials, and were in turn reinforced by political support concentrated in urban centers. Through the signifying practices of their protest actions, these activists constructed resource extraction as both a singular point of origin of a range of social, economic, and environmental pathologies, and as a process comprising multiple sites of intervention on the part of state and corporate actors, and therefore, of course, multiple opportunities for resistance. The two week long march for water, life, and the dignity of peoples, which departed from the Southeastern Amazon on March 8, 2012, and arrived in Quito on March 22nd, politically repurposed the circuits of the extractive model. I accompanied the marchers, a few hundred at first, as we traversed 700 kilometers on foot and in unwieldy caravans, the number swelling to 25,000 in Quito. We began in the town of Pangi, within what bureaucrats and corporate actors called the quote, zone of influence of the Mirador mine, the first large scale mine with an exploitation contract in Ecuador's history a contract that was suspiciously signed just days before the march commenced. We zigzagged through the Southern Andes, home to more planned mining projects in the highland wetlands, which supply water to rural farmers and urban consumers alike. We were subsequently joined by brigades from the Northern Amazon, traveling in the same direction as the crude that flowed through notoriously faulty pipelines. And finally, we arrived in Quito, where the state coffers, voters, and armed forces form the complex of incentives, democratic legitimacy, and sanctions that activists claimed kept the model in motion. In the words and imagery disseminated throughout the mobilization process, marchers proposed an alternative model, a post-extractive vision in which the polity was not a machine that ran on fossil fuels, but a plural collectivity comprising cultures and ecosystems alike. They declared, we are water, we will flood Quito. In the most widely circulating poster, the variously sized drops of water were arranged so that they formed one big drop and were superimposed on a map of Ecuador crisscrossed by blue lines representing its waterways. The composition invoked an aquatic Leviathan, like the sovereign whose authority both contained and was constituted by his subjects, the image reconfigured Ecuador as a republic of water in which elements of nature were not only rights bearing subjects as per the 2008 constitution, but active members of the polity. As the pamphlet on the march published by the collective Mineria Muerte stated, we want to march for water, life, and the dignity of peoples, march towards splendid life, to a new civilization, to the true sumac causai, where we recognize ourselves as the sisters and brothers of the tree, of the bird, and the bacteria, 
brothers and sisters of the drops of rain, indigenous to the, to the planet Earth, daughters and sons to the only mother, sisters and brothers with equal rights. Anti-extractivism radically decentered human beings. Crude and ore were political protagonists. Wetlands and mountains were moral agents. It was a truly post neoliberal project. The activists and intellectuals who crafted this discursive political strategy sought to not only transform the regime they had labeled neoliberalism, but also to transcend the repertoire of anti-neoliberal resistance. The problematic of extractivismo shifted the focus away from the classic concerns of both Marxism and egalitarian liberalism, the mode of production, the property regime, the pattern of distribution, the regulation of the economy, or the means to socioeconomic development. In its purest form, the perspective of extractivismo discourse regarded these concepts and their political targets as not only insufficient, but as reproducing the developmentalist pathology that was the essence of Western civilization. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, um, Thea, um, for, you know, for that extract that really frames out, I think, some of the discussion that we're going to have. Um, so we, we're going to do about a half hour of, of discussion here and then bring in uh, the audience so people can start putting in their, their questions as well um, to Thea. Uh, the first thing I want to ask, though, is really just where this project came from. Um, what were the origins? What was the genesis? What led you to, uh, you know, to address these questions, to be drawn to them? And then maybe what, uh, what was transformed for you in the course of, of, of addressing these questions, of confronting them? Yeah, thank you for starting there. Um, um, because this book was born um, well before I knew it would be a book. I mean, I think in a similar way um, uh, to, to, to your own book on, on, um, on a people's history of Venezuela, that, that the sort of inspiration for this was well before I, I had anything like a written text in mind. Um, and what, where it began was in 2008. Um, where I, in the year that, that myself and my partner moved to Ecuador, um, and we moved there because we had promised ourselves that we would move to South America. We had been long involved in solidarity activism in the US. Um, we had both traveled a lot to, to Latin America uh, and the Caribbean, but had, had not ever for an extended period of time lived there. So we moved to Ecuador. And we moved to Ecuador a little bit arbitrarily um, in the sense that, you know, there are other places we could have moved to in that moment that would have been equally exciting. But Ecuador was a place that was like the, much of the rest of the region um, being swept up in, in, in what scholars have called the, the pink tide, right? The sort of spate of, of left-wing governments. That is, I don't think it can be emphasized enough, especially for those that don't you know, immediately study the pink tide, it's just a world historic moment uh, in the sense that I can't think of another moment where in a single region of the world, you have so many left wing governments elected out of so many parallel processes of social struggle to the point where you have people that proclaim themselves um, to be socialist, to be anti-imperialist, um, to be committed to more direct forms of democracy, occupying halls of power at the same time that you have movements with very similar goals, though, of course, you know, we'll get into the tensions between them. But for now, I'll just say with very similar sort of um, uh, horizons of transformation as as those that are in power and that sort of dynamic of movement and state is just, I think, you know, unprecedented um, and, un and unparalleled um, um, in the 20th century. So and, and tw early 21st. So I wanted, you know, we wanted to move somewhere in, in Latin America and we chose Ecuador because it was very much in this process um, of the left in power and the left in resistance simultaneously. Um, and it was also an early moment in its pink tide, tide trajectory, unlike Venezuela, um, uh, where Hugo Chavez came to power in 99, um, or in Bolivia, you have a couple of years earlier than Ecuador. We moved to Ecuador, um, my partner and I, like right, right after Korea came to power, really. Um, and it, it was had that that sense of heady optimism, right? We're we're gonna go to this place. Movements have critically but enthusiastically supported uh, this government coming to power. They're about to rewrite the constitution with much more involvement of movements than you know had ever been the case before and in Ecuador's past. And so there was just a lot going on that felt optimistic, inspiring. Um, and so we get there. 
Um, and, you know, it's at that moment of sort of encounter of like the, 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 the people and places on the ground, as Gio said, um, where you realize that, of course, things are super complicated, right? Doesn't make them less heady or optimistic or inspiring, but it does make them more nuanced, more complex and have maybe more internal tensions than you, than you originally um, had, had, had thought, you know, before arriving. Um, and I just want to make, you know, one note, which is that, and then I'll say just a little bit more about what inspired the book. But as I said, I had been sort of long involved as a solidarity activist, and I had been used to the tension between movement and state. I had been used as a solidarity activist to having to make difficult choices of like, are we in solidarity with the movements or are we in solidarity with the left wing government? How do we, you know, how do we do solidarity in this moment where the left is in power, right? Um, and so that was already a sort of ethical and political set of questions I was used to. What I was not prepared for and what really took me by storm and then inspired this book was what the points of contention specifically were between movement and state and also within the state and within the movement. Because another thing I learned quickly is that the state is not a black box. There are all sorts of actors with different ideological positions and political formations that populate bureaucracies and the movements are not a black box, right? Like, you know, all the way down to the literal level of the community or the popular barrio, like there are disagreements, but of course there are also disagreements between organizations and tendencies. So what pulled me in so much to Ecuador and what made me return to do dissertation work and then to write this book was what the points of contention were. And what they were as Gio laid out and my excerpt gave a little taste of was, um, you know, what we might call like the ecological foundations of global capitalism. Like what are the sort of socio-natural metabolisms that are required by a rapacious economic system? And then coming from a perspective that I'll just call a third world perspective to sort of situate it in a longer trajectory, or we could call a global south perspective, like what can be done, right? How do you get out of those extractive circuits? Do you deepen them temporarily so you can build up the capital to invest in other sectors? That's one approach. Do you just resist and say no to all of it? Do you adopt some granular nuance but tricky perspective of like what is okay extraction, what is not okay extraction? And you know, it's a series of impossible positions due to the nature of the world order, we might say, but that doesn't mean that there isn't real agency on the ground in sort of grappling with those dilemmas. And that that's what was so inspiring and, and confusing, to be honest. And it took me sort of writing the book to just get a basic grasp on like the complexity of each of these positions and how they were in dialogue with one another, even as they deeply disputed one another. Um, really uh, building directly off the tensions that you, you just drew up, right? Um, I want to ask um, about you know, uh, you maybe, uh, you know, point toward trying to put our finger on some of the deeper tensions that, that underlay this question of, of movements versus the state and the um, inescapability of, of these tensions on some level. Um, and I was thinking when I was reading your book um, about this moment where, you know, where in Venezuela, um, a movement in, in Western Venezuela near the oil producing region near Maracaibo of Yucpa, in, indigenous people um, had a leader named Sabino Romero, um, who was a radical leader um, demanding indigenous autonomy in the region, eventually was murdered by landholders. But before that, he traveled to Caracas to uh, raise attention and, and, and demand autonomy. And what was peculiar about this was that in the indigenous minister met him in the streets, uh, an indigenous woman, uh, I believe at the time it was Nisia Maldonado, and they began to debate um, the question of extractivism and how to address um, extractivism. And on the one hand, they agreed on a great deal. They, they both appealed to the Bolivarian constitution, which upheld indigenous autonomy, and yet they disagreed in a very interesting way on um, the mediations of that autonomy. Um, because Romero, Sabino Romero was saying, this constitution promises us indigenous autonomy, that's what we're claiming. And from the perspective of this indigenous minister, um, it was the state that mediated those claims to autonomy. You have to come to the state, um, you have to come to the state as the representative of that nation uh, as a whole to, uh, to address the concrete questions of how to manage that, that autonomy. Um, and, and while I think that, you know, that opposition seems a little simplistic on, on some level, um, it also raises important questions about redistribution, right? Because the implications of a kind of radical autonomy over the territory that one inhabits 
also uh, involves a claim over those resources and um, and a that would prevent the redistribution of those resources to everyone in the nation. Um, and that was what seemed to me to be one of the zero sum tensions that emerges from this extractivist debate. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit in, in the Ecuadorian context or to the broader questions of, of extractivism and the state and the nation. Yeah, thank you. That's a great setup and, and interesting to see how um, how these dilemmas sort of resonate in, in, in different contexts. And, and I definitely take your point, which I've learned from your own work and um, I'm in conversations with others that work on Venezuela that compared to Ecuador and, and the Andes, there was perhaps this was less the, the crux of, of, of debate between movements and the state. Um, but that's not to say that they that it didn't emerge and, and actually have some similar characteristics, given what you just said, to how the debates emerged in, in Ecuador. Um, let me kind of set this up a little bit, um, which is to say that that the this kind of tension over who rules, which is this key question of, of popular sovereignty, like who is the subject of, of democracy and who can make decisions and what kind of powers does that subject have, um, and is, is brought to the fore in a very interesting way by what we might call the uneven territoriality of extraction. And what I mean by the uneven territoriality of extraction, um, it's sort of just a sub concept of like, you know, combined and uneven development of capitalism itself, which is that extraction affects some territories more directly than others and some peoples more directly than others. Um, and the benefits oftentimes for various reasons don't align with where the costs are, right? So like if you're a community that is a subjected to the pollution and contamination of extractive capitalism, you're also by, you know, in, in a, almost by that same token, unlikely to directly benefit from that extraction, right? So there's a disjunct between territorially or spatially between where the environmental and social costs are paid and then where the, the benefits might accrue. And in what this looked like in Ecuador, which is not dissimilar from, from Venezuela, though I don't wanna make the parallels too, too strong, but um, is that the, the environmental um, havoc was mainly in the rural peripheries um, of the Southern Andes, of the, of the Amazon, um, of the Northern and Southern Amazon. And the, a lot of the, the, the sort of resource rent funded development um, benefited people everywhere actually, but, but in terms of the density of people, it benefited people that, that for the most part are gonna live in urban areas just because, you know, e though, though Ecuador is not as urbanized as Venezuela, it's still, you know, the majority of the population lives in urban centers, right? So you have a sort of rough majority that, that um, and especially when we're talking about low and, and, and middle income people that, that live in urban areas that under a, a pink tide government that is specifically directing resource rents to social spending, benefit a tremendous deal from resource funded sort of growth and jobs and social spending and, and public infrastructure. Whereas you have communities that may be mestizo, may be indigenous, may be, may be Afro-descendant that live in rural areas that also may benefit from those same forms of expenditures, um, but they also more directly and sometimes even before the benefits arrive are impacted by the negative effects of extraction. So that's the sort of uneven territoriality. And I think what that does is sort of set up a very interesting set of debates over who should have a say over whether extractive projects move forward. Um, and this debate was extremely live in Ecuador. I, I treat it in like, I almost treat it in two full chapters of the book because it's, it's a really central crux of debate. The question of who rules, who is the demos, um, you know, who does the constitution empower? And the constitution itself is ambivalent. You have a constitution that is um, on the one hand, it, it, it establishes a plurinational state. So even there we have a plurality to who the people are. Um, and then it also says it is a constitution founded in the popular sovereignty of the people as a sort of unified subject. So there's, you know, the ambivalence gets to even the sentence level of the constitution between these multiple nations, um, uh, which are generally seen as sort of indigenous nations and peoples, though there are other peoples in Ecuador that are non-indigenous that identify as sort of part of plurinationality. Um, and then this unified, univocal, more um, uh, classical form of the democratic subject as sort of the people. Um, and then we could even get into, and, and a lot of Geo's work gets into this, that like the people themselves or the demos in Latin American leftist 
tradition is not just like everybody. It's not the nation. It's, it's the poor. It's the dispossessed. It's like a popular subject. So you have like three or four different subjects right there um, in terms of who should or could or is in power to make these decisions over attractive projects that are um, that are sort of shaped both by that uneven territoriality and by what's the con what the constitution itself lays out. And what this resulted in is, is a series of very fraught and intense and, and sometimes you know physically confrontational um, disputes over who rules in specific cases. And one of those I go over in, in chapter four where a, a community held its own vote, its own sort of direct democratic vote over whether they wanted a mining project or not, which a vote that the Korea administration refused to recognize. Um, but the Korea administration, you know, had had a lot of good grounding in other visions of democracy, right? Like they were majority elected. They had the highest approval ratings, like I think in Ecuadorian history, they were redistributing the benefits to a large um, part of the population. So they had democratic credentials as well. And so you have basically competing democratic credentials. Um, the in, uh, indigenous peoples that have rights that are set out in the constitution, um, rights not only to sort of territorial and cultural integrity, but to be consulted prior to extractive projects. You have a larger sort of democratic um, subject that, that has voted time and again for this president who has said time and again, he will extract these resources. And, you know, you know, between equal rights forced aside, in a sense, right? And there were these fraught conflicts and moments where though smaller in number, the indigenous communities were able to force the question in their favor. They stalled projects, right? Physically confronting, using direct action, a variety of tactics. There were other moments where um, despite um, uh, uh, protests from the local community, the project went forward, right? And so, you know, you have these, these just to repeat, you know, equal rights in a sense, because the constitution endows both with rights, force decides in the sense that like, it's in the, in the heat of these conflicts that it goes one way or the other. Thank you for that. Um, and I think that, you know, that speaks to conflicts across the region. It speaks to, uh, you know, um, tensions that have kind of dire and very real political consequences, right? When you, when you talk to people about the, moments that saw really the beginning of the decline in support for the uh, government of Evo Morales in Bolivia, for example, a lot of people mentioned the highway through the Tipnis um, and don't mention very often the fact that this, uh, you know, that debates over this were really divided in the same way that you mentioned, right, between indigenous communities, island and lowland, between people who saw um, increased access to jobs and commerce um, as the potential benefit to them of, of development projects and those who reject the development projects uh, kind of out of hand. Um, and, and so you reach a point where there's a coup in Bolivia and many on the left are refusing to call it a coup, right? Um, which is not justified, but at the same time draws its roots from uh, these very real tensions that we have yet to resolve, I think, around uh, questions of development, um, questions of extractivism and how to relate those to democratic questions with both sides claiming democracy, right? Um, I think, you know, a lot of the questions and the themes that, that we're going to go back and forth on circle around through, through similar thematics, but on a different register. And I want to step to kind of the, you know, almost the epistemological register or, or at least to the, to the register of what you call a situated material critique and I ask you to explain that a little bit. Um, because we, you know, again, one of the most frustrating things about dealing with these fraught questions in Latin America um, has to do with the way in which critique is deployed, even within Venezuela, right? There are debates around what is a principal critique of the, of the Bolivarian revolution? What is an unprincipled critique? We're often told that if we live in the United States that no critique is valid whatsoever. And yet then, you know, we're, we're actually required to engage on some level in critique, um, but that critique always has to be, um, you know, always has to be respectful of a certain understanding of, of contextualized, situated, processes. And so how do you understand one's relation to, to those processes and critique? That's, um, that's a really good question. And it's, it's, it's a challenging one to answer. I'm going to say what I meant in the book by it. And then I'm going to do my best to answer the sort of meta question, which is like, what zooming out from Ecuador, um, like what, what does it mean to engage in, 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 in forms of solidarity that, that allow for critique, but also that um, that are sensitive to the the power differentials um, of being in the U.S. versus being in that in in, in the immediate context in, with which one is in solidarity with. So I'll try to I'll do my best on that 
in a way more difficult question. Let me just start with what I meant by it in the book. Um, so the reason that I highlight in the introduction, which, which Gio is referring to, um, what my approach is to critique is, um, comes out of actually a, a series of conversations that I was forced to have being a political scientist, quote unquote, which is, um, you know, whenever I, I presented my work as a grad student, as a young scholar, uh, people always gave me this reaction of like, you talk a lot about what people say. I'm like, what does that matter? It's what they do that matters. Or like, you know, I get even more specific renditions of this, of like, you, you your book is about mining and about oil. How could it possibly matter what people's rhetoric is? Like, talk about the real material stuff, right? And so this frustrated me to no end because like as someone with a lot of, you know, organizing and activist experience, I'm extremely aware that words matter, right? Like not just in, in the way that Gio was pointing to where there are ethical and political decisions to be made about how to even hold debates, but also the fact that if you're like organizing a protest, you need to decide on a slogan or you need to write your banner, right? And you need to do your press release and your messaging and, and also that internally within movements, a lot of important elements of, of, of movements are discursively mediated, right? So you have a meeting together, you figure out internally what your tactics are gonna be, you come to consensus or you don't, right? You argue with other groups, you argue with one another. And also anyone, again, that's been involved in, in sort of this type of activism knows that it's not just the official communications that matter, it's the side conversations, you know, it's the, it's the stuff that maybe you, you jot down or you write an email about, right? And so all of these different textual artifacts um, and discursive artifacts are, in my view, woven through political activity and enable political activity in ways that I almost had to like sort of re-engineer to demonstrate that to people that somehow don't understand that discourse is a material act. And, you know, you can go back to Karl Marx if you want and look at the German ideology and look at how he describes, you know, the language of social life as being imbricated with material conditions, right? And so that was part of the, the reason I wrote that. But then, you know, as I started thinking about discourse as material, which was my first goal, um, I also started to think about critique, right? and critique as a certain genre of political discourse um, that um, has a certain object, it has a certain target, it often involves a certain systematicity, like you're, you're critiquing like a system and you're saying why it's bad. Um, and I think that, you know, there's this long and just to me, tremendously interesting um, lineage of critical discourse and critical um, thought in Latin America that I think is deeply understudied in the US, you know, whether it's in political theory or in, you know, in other in humanities. Um, it's partly through the work of, of folks like Gio that now it's, it's getting much more attention, but, but it, it, it's not studied enough. And I think it's just an extremely rich tradition. We tend to just study Europe and the sort of the Anglo-American world, but, you know, Latin America has a fascinating tradition of political thought. Specifically, what I was looking at is like left-wing political thought. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm interested in this tradition of critique um, on the left in Latin America. I think it's given us, given us like the global left, I'm just gonna speak super broadly and ambitiously, some of our most important concepts, like thinking about things like I mentioned earlier about the unevenness of global capitalism, about dependency theory, about the enclave, about the periphery, the metropole, like all of these were developed in sort of 1970s and a little bit earlier as well, um, Marxist circles in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And, you know, in many ways, what I, what I learned by writing this book, and I'm gonna sort of resonate a little bit with something Gio said earlier about my optimism, um, which is one of the things I found is that even in the most kind of intense critiques of indigenous environmental movements, their critiques of the Korea administration or the Pink Tide for being extractivist, even in, or maybe especially in their most pointed critiques, I saw kind of shared intellectual lineages between the Korea administration, between the left in power, between, um, uh, you know, broadly like the, 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 the targets of the anti-extractive critique and the anti-extractive movements themselves. And one of these key sort of shared vocabularies is what I just mentioned, dependency theory, third world Marxism, um, revolutionary nationalism, these are sort of vocabularies that are shared broadly in the global south. A lot of them have specific resonance in Latin America. And as much as um, Korea, the Korea government and the movements deeply disagreed over, as we were saying earlier, like who should decide over resource extraction, as much as as deep as those disagreements were, their depth was born 
of, of a shared lineage. Um, and, you know, I think that kind of looking at the subtly um, and with care, the actual languages that people use and the way that they describe their positions sort of lends itself to not to seeing like commonalities, like in a sort of like everyone's the same kind of way, but, but understanding what the, the shared frames of references are. Um, and that to me was like an interesting discovery that my sort of method of discursive analysis enabled. Um, I'm gonna try briefly to touch on the more challenging question that Gio posed, which is that, you know, given a context like Ecuador, let's just stick with Ecuador, though I think you could have very similar conversations with Bolivia and Venezuela, two other places that have already been mentioned, like given the fact that movements don't always agree with one another, that there's diversity within movements, across movements, and even within the state itself, which is something that my book attends to quite a bit, you know, bureaucrats that had very distinct visions of, of extraction. Given that, like, what does it mean to be in, in solidarity? Um, and, you know, I, this is something that I've grappled with, um, honestly, since Chavez came to power. At that moment, I was involved in a Latin American solidarity organization, and we were very supportive of, of came to an internal decision and were very supportive of, of, of what was happening with the Bolivarian revolution. We had delegates come from, from the Venezuelan government. We sent delegations to um, Venezuela. Though it's interesting, I, I didn't participate in the delegation to Caracas, but like it was actually in that moment that we discovered what Geo's book is about. We discovered that there are these militant movements, urban based and, and meant not, though not exclusively, that had all sorts of critiques of Chavismo even as they identified as Chavista, right? So we sort of encountered that complexity. And, you know, I don't have an, an easy answer to this. I, my tendency is to do something that might be untenable and might point to my stubborn, maybe annoying optimism, which is that on the one hand, I think that that visibilizing the nuances, complexities, and internal forms of dissent is part of recognizing people's equal agency, right? I think that it it is, it's a form of, of downplaying the agency of Latin American movements and the global South more generally to sort of pretend that people all agree with one another, right? So I think there's a way in which it's like a deeply egalitarian and human and ethical act to say, listen, the folks that we're in solidarity with, they don't even all share the same opinion with one another, right? And I think that's important. On the other hand, I also very much recognize, and I you know think about this myself when I do sort of solidarity work, that there's a particular positionality to being in the US and there's a particular positionality to being in the global north that um, that is that comes with baggage and privilege, right? And that comes with a certain responsibility um, to do what you can to not, um, to not in a reactive manner dismiss um, self-described emancipatory projects coming out of the global south, right? Because what the global north has done for a long time is, is repress those brutally. So, you know, trying to do both of those at once and you can't do them both perfectly, but I think that they're, those are my dual kind of North stars in terms of how I approach those broader solidarity conversations and the issue of internal dissensus and internal critique um, in, in the processes that, that we're um, speaking across. Thank you for that. Um, just quickly before uh, we get to, uh, to questions from the audience, which I hope are rolling in as we speak, um, I want to ask you to help us look forward a little bit. Um, and, and one of the, you know, one of the critiques um, that comes out of extractivism, or maybe not even from extractivism, but more broadly, is that the pink tide in general and the uh, stability of left-wing governments um, during the, the previous decades relied on a resource boom, right? Heavily driven by, uh, by Chinese consumption in particular, which was driven by a specific uh, you know, level of production and form of production that was taking place in China. And one of the arguments is that precisely what we've seen, and, and this is true, one of the, you know, part of the crisis that has emerged has to do with Chinese demand dropping, the shifting of the Chinese productive matrix. Um, and, um, and the kind of long-term crisis that this might entail for Latin American uh, governments if they rely on resources. Um, and I wanna ask you what you think looking forward and also about some of the kind of counterintuitive impacts of resource prices. So, you know, on, on the one hand, when oil prices were incredibly high uh, in Venezuela, movements could draw on that money and be very strong, but also develop levels of dependency. Um, outside of Venezuela, the, you know, I think very few people recognize the fact that the high oil prices were one of the huge stimuli of 
uh, green energy uh, abroad um, and help to propel our debates in different directions. Um, and so, uh, you know, what happens when resource prices drop, when governments like Ecuador and Bolivia need resources at the same time that the extraction of those resources is becoming less and less uh, profitable? Yeah, that's a great, great set of questions and something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, so I'll try to actually contain my answer because I think I could I could say a lot here. What, one thing that I want to start with is actually where you ended because I think it'll frame things nicely. Like one of the things I realized in writing this book and doing a lot of sort of research on the political economy of, of extraction is um, what the specific dilemmas are for an extractive model of development for the left, right? Because we get this really, in my view, extremely simplistic analysis in social science and the mass media and public policy worlds, which is just like resources are a curse. And that, that idea just doesn't hold up water in any way, shape or form. The idea is that oil inevitably leads to authoritarianism or underdevelopment. And there's just way too much internal diversity of outcomes across different oil dependent states that it's like a bonkers idea in my perception. Also, I think, you know, Timothy Mitchell probably wrote the best one sentence takedown of this idea of a resource curse, which is that he wrote in Carbon Democracy, all states are oil states. Like the idea that there are some oil states and some non-oil states is kind of ludicrous because we live in fossil fuel capitalism and all states partake in the circuits of, of, of the sort of distribution, consumption, extraction of, of fossil fuels, right? So that's just to kind of clear the air around that. I'm not going to argue for some kind of inevitability, um, but I do think that there are politically mediated um, dilemmas and paradoxes of resource extraction for the left, for a left that has a transformative vision in particular. And they're what Geo began to lay out um, that, you know, in boom times, there is a lot to go around. There is a lot to invest in, um, in directly meeting unmet social needs. And these are unmet needs that had accumulated for decades, if not 500 years, right? I mean, so there's a lot of, of in austerity and cruelty that had been imposed on popular sectors during the neoliberal period, during dictatorships, et cetera. And those sectors were rightfully clamoring for their needs to be met, housing, education, healthcare, or, you know, roads, whatever it is, right? So, so, so there is a lot of demand for, for, um, for redistribution of resources. And that demand is, is possible to be met during a resource boom without you know, without changing the structure of the state, without changing the fiscal basis of the state, without doing anything too complicated, you can basically meet social need um, where it's at, right? Um, the, what, what is the problem with that? I mean, one problem is, is what Gio mentioned, which is this critique that itself is an internal critique within Latin America and within the Latin American left, that this results in this sort of dependency or demobilization or pacification of the popular sectors, like they take these handouts or something and they, they stop protesting. I think it's an interesting critique, though I don't think it's fully borne out because we do see a tremendous amount of political activity during the pink tide in power. But you know, I could certainly see you know, the logic of that critique. And I think in some cases, there's some empirical validity to it. I think that in addition to that, there's um, two other issues. And one of them in a way relate, well, both of them actually relate to the sort of, we might say sort of decline of the pink tide or the retreat or whatever word that you wanna use. One is that um, infusing economic resources into communities, into households, into people's lives changes changes people's class position and, and maybe more than their class position, their class sort of identity and subjectivity, right? So what it does, and, and we've seen this in a number of contexts, is sort of create a precarious lower middle class sort of, or a middle-ish class, right? And middle class more in its consumption capacities than its real financial security, right? So you have people that can buy things that they couldn't buy before, right? Um, and, and have access to things, you know, whether it's Wi-Fi or a smartphone or, you know, whatever brand that they couldn't buy before. And they, and it's through those consumer habits that people may occupy the position of like, I'm middle class. And as soon as someone occupies that position, we know that very well from US history, where like, apparently all of us are middle class, right? Though that's changing a little bit, but a lot of people identify as middle class, even if they're poor or rich, is that it changes people's politics to identify that way. And we see a situation of sort of precariously and newly middle-class people um, disinvesting in the left project to some extent, detaching from it, right? And being available for right-wing discourses of security, of property, of family, of religion, right? Um, you know, the tragic thing is that, that that security was very precarious, right? And so then you actually have a situation where 
maybe the right is briefly able to sort of um, uh, uh, sort of channel that those sentiments in a rightward direction. But to my knowledge, and you know, or to my mind, I don't know if Gio disagrees. I think the right's hold on power is also tenuous in a sense, right? Because that middle class status was so tenuous, and people are slipping rapidly and 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 very tragically back into positions of of poverty and precarity that they were before. In fact, what we're seeing now in Latin America is that people um, is that the the gains made under the pink tide and during the commodity boom are being wiped away by the, obviously what's happening right now with the pandemic, but it predates the pandemic. It's the right coming to power. It's the crash in the commodity prices. It's all sorts of things, right? And we're seeing really big spikes in poverty, but also in hunger and a number of other concerning outcomes. Um, so that's that's one set of dilemmas. It's like the changing class composition of the coalition that, that, that enables the left being in power um, and also accounts for its decline in, in support. There's one other piece that I'd like to get to, which which is that um, when left governments or any government, but this is particularly important to the left because it has a transformative vision, it has a sort of class conflict orientation, is that what the resource boom allows you to do is redistribute to the masses without taking assets from the rich, right? And I and I think you know in many ways the right wing in Latin America and the right wing media and also the conservative you know media et cetera in the U.S to some extent overplayed how much um, nationalization and expropriation and actually taking of rich people's assets there was in some of these contexts. There were moments of more class confrontation for sure, but I think overall what attenuated the literal you know, transfer of assets from the rich to the poor was the fact that you had this other revenue stream that came in and sort of allowed governments to, um, to address people's needs without um, basically invoking the specter of right-wing reaction. The problem is that as soon as the prices, the commodity prices go down, the right wing was never a faithful ally and they're ready to get you out of power as soon as you're unable to meet people's needs without expropriation, right? So we see that political economy play out in very dynamic ways. The last thing I'll say here, because I, I know I said I could go on and I've already gone on a bit, is that you know what I'm thinking since the book, because I think you know, Gio said he wants to point forward with this question. It's a really grim picture in Latin America, in the world, in the whole world, of course, but in Latin America in particular, there are ways that in a way similar to the US, which points to some kind of like settler colonial resonances across um, across the hemisphere, the, the pandemic and the response to it has just exposed like deep, deep um, problems with the kind of political economic structure of Latin America. The fact that so many labor in the informal economy and have no recourse to, to benefits or to unemployment benefits when they're not in work and you know all sorts of things. So there's really deep devastation in, in Latin America right now. And I don't think that there's any possibility of this type of commodity boom repeating itself in the near future. The commodity boom itself roughly from 2000 to 2014 was historically very, um, very unusual. Um, it's unusual for so many commodities to experience such high prices at the same time. And it's an artifact of China's specific period of industrialization that it was going through at the moment, um, as well as some other emerging economies. So I don't see that repeating itself anytime soon. I foresee a sort of low growth period, which we know tends to coincide with pretty brutal austerity, right, for the working class and, and poor in Latin America. And so what I've been thinking about more and this kind of makes the, the task more difficult, but I think it brings in the global north and brings in solidarity in a new way, is to think about the fact that these problems are not fully solvable within Latin America. I think these problems involve deep changes that we should call for as much as possible in, in our activism and in our you know, policy work and where, wherever we're situated that have to come from, to some extent, the global north and, and the sort of um, ambits of, of global power. And I mean things like canceling sovereign debt, I, you know, I think it's basically untenable for the global South to be under the chokehold of debt when they need to address a pandemic, a public health crisis, the ecological crisis, and, and a growing hunger and food insecurity crisis throughout the global South. Um, so thinking about, you know, canceling debt, thinking about changing, you know, the productive and cons consumer models within the global North so that they don't require such rapacious extraction, right? Thinking about how the North and South are interconnected in these ways that involve, require, I should say, global and transnational change to take place, rather than expecting the change to just come solely through um, policy choices made in the global South. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, 
I feel like we could just go on talking forever. Um, and I will talk to you about some of that after we get off uh, as well. But we've got about 20 minutes left um, for questions. Um, I'm not sure if any questions have come in or if other uh, you know, folks here from C21 want to throw in theirs as well. We have a comment and a question that I will throw in. They're both from Jennifer Lawrence. And Jennifer writes, thanks for drawing out the importance of language and naming. I think Thea in reference to your earlier conversation about your discourse analysis. What it means for the ways that policy and political action is shaped as well as how imaginaries and alternatives are shaped by language. Could you say more about the discourse of extractivism and how it's been taken up as a way to enable in scare quotes, social goods through extractive practices slash rents and how it's shaped the discourse more broadly? So thank you for that question. Um, and, and to begin with, I'm gonna clarify something a little bit that you know it's probably my own, well, I'm sure it's my own fault. I'm the author, so I only have myself to blame that sometimes this doesn't come across clearly, but perhaps in the book a little more so than in a brief conversation. Um, when I talk about the discourse of extractivism and what I try to refer to as extractivismo discourse, just to label it, um, I think sometimes keeping it in the Spanish helps it, it you know, kind of be labeled as a coherent object. I mean the discourse that activists use to critique what they called, and I, and I emphasize what they call the extractive model of development. I don't emphasize that to say that I think there's no such thing as the extractive model of development. I use it too, but I like as much as possible to give sort of credit and to credit the intellectual production of those activists and to kind of show how they articulated a rather novel critical discourse. And it's novel in ways I address very briefly in the excerpt I read. Um, what I mean by novel is that it's novel within the left. It departs in many ways from sort of classical forms of leftism, whether they you know, are Marxist or socialist utopian, or you know, there's a variety of strands of, of leftism out there, of course, but they depart from, from many of those strands. Um, and what extractivismo discourse does is sort of reorient a bit um, away from what we might take to be some classical concerns of the left, like who owns the means of production? What are the relations of production? What is produced? Um, and in, in Latin America, the global South, questions of development, you know, is it a revolutionary route to, to development or is it a national populist route to development, right? But development itself was not, I mean, Gio can correct me if I'm wrong, because he's more knowledgeable about the history of sort of critical thought in Latin America, but um, you know, even revolutionary Marxists were not per se questioning that development was the goal, right? They disagreed with national populists about whether you can ally with the domestic bourgeoisie or not, or whether you had to smash the state or, you know, whether, you know, how you actually got there, what the route to power was. But what's unique about extractivismo discourse, or a few things are unique. One thing is precisely that. It calls into question the horizon of many leftisms of the past, which is something like socioeconomic development or progress, right? It, it, it sees progress and development as themselves artifacts of coloniality, of a sort of imposition of power that started with the, con the conquest and violent insertion into the world market and continues through a variety of neo-colonial forms, right? So it, it questions the sort of end goal of pri some prior emancipatory movements um, and, and theories. Um, the other thing and this or a few other things. So one, one other that that um, that I, I just sort of brought up is it's a very long durée time scale. So extractivismo discourse sees the problem of extractivism as something that was instantiated with colonial conquest and something that continues to the present and is actually further and further re reproduced in the present. So that, you know, it's a 500 year long problem. Um, and and that, that gives it, you know, some of its theoretical or discursive ambition comes from the sort of time, time scale. Um, two other things that I'll note. One is, um, and this might be specific to, to Ecuador, though I think again, they're, they're shared, um, there's resonances across across contexts in Latin America. There is a focus on the territories, the physical spaces of extraction, um, and not just the places where extraction has already occurred, but the places where it hasn't yet occurred. And this is actually an interesting thing that 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 in a way Geo implicitly referenced with that contrast between Venezuela and Ecuador earlier, which is that Venezuela. Um, has a longstanding extractive sector oil. So does Ecuador, it has a longstanding extractive sector oil. They date to around the same moment um, in history, 
But what's different about Ecuador um, is that Ecuador, the, the Korea government was very committed to a new extractive sector. I know that Chavez um, and, and Maduro have also wanted to develop um, mining in Venezuela, but I think it wasn't quite as emphasized as in Ecuador. Ecuador was like, we're gonna go for mining, it's the next big thing. Um, and so, you know, what I sort of argue in the book was that it was the one aspect of, of the politicization of extraction in Ecuador was the development of this new extractive sector of mining. And one of the interesting things that I learned while, while I was there was, or, or encountered while I was there, was the degree to which activists focused on landscapes, ecosystems, and communities that had not yet been affected by extraction. Um, it, it's a kind of, you know, I call this in another paper, a proleptic form of protest, like it's future oriented, it foreshadows an extraction that has not yet occurred, it foreshadows a ruin, an extractive ruin that has not yet occurred. Um, and it imagines what could occur in order to mobilize resistance in the present through a kind of future oriented nostalgia. And so I think that sort of temporality of future, present, and past is quite interesting and, and I would say unique to the kind of lens of extractivism. And then the last thing I would say is the focus, politically, political focus on directly affected communities, which sets up that tension between the directly affected communities who may very well, and in most cases are the sort of minority of the population and even the minority of the sort of popular sectors versus those who may not be directly affected but maybe are affected in other ways, especially when we think about air pollution and stuff like that, but may not be directly affected by a mining project, but may stand to benefit from the welfare that it funds. And so that focus on the directly affected community as a protagonist, as a victim and as a protagonist, right? And so the mobilization of communities at potential sites of extraction um, to resist that extraction because of its threat to their culture, ecosystems, environment, and sort of life ways is the kind of hallmark of, of extractive discourse. Thank you. We have another really good question I'd like to bring relay to you from the chat. So Matthew Ford writes, I'm not sure if you make this argument in the book, but you have previously written the Amazonian indigenous discourse of demanding territory rather than land is rooted in regional isolation, um, in parentheses, from the state and from other indigenous people until the 1960s. So how do you square this argument with the well-known impacts of the rubber boom long before oil? In other words, if this territorial based politics is not rooted in lowland indigenous people's isolation, is there another explanatory factor? Yeah, very interesting and a, a close reader and also bringing up an example um, that I'm, I'm actually going to start learning about because I have a new kind of project that is bringing me to, to different sort of commodity histories and, and, and rubber might be something I learn a little bit more about. But, but let me just, just lay out um, for folks that are not as versed in this distinction, what I mean by the distinction between territory and land. Sorry, those dogs are not my dogs, but they're household dogs. Anyway, um, so territory versus land. Um, and this is not my own distinction. It's one that other scholars have, have made, but it's, it's more importantly than that, a, a distinction in the everyday language of, of indigenous activists in, in Ecuador um, and, and elsewhere in, in the region. So simplifying dramatically, in the highlands, which is the, the Andean, you know, the mountainous region of, of Ecuador, which is where the capital Quito is, um, that was the place that Spanish conquest, what happened most dramatically, most successfully, they consolidated the Spanish empire in that region. Um, and so there's a long, like a long-term conquest of, of the highlands that starts with the Spanish and then when there's an independence, a sort of Creole independence, um, then you have indigenous people living under Creoles instead of Spaniards. It's not super different from their perspective. They still live um, in sort of semi-indentured uh, servitude um, and, are, uh, and are subjected to extremely unequal land distribution that is brutally enforced in a variety of repressive ways, right? And so what you have in the highlands is this long history of struggle over land. And the reason I use the word land, tierra en español, is that it, the struggle um, uh, sort of hinges on the distribution of land, the ownership of land, the control of land. And this struggle was waged against, as I said, Spaniards, against Creole elites, against you know, multinational corporations when they come in. Um, and it was a struggle over who controls the land. And so, and it was like a peasant struggle waged in the vocabulary of sort of peasant movements around the world. Um, I wanna just complexify this briefly, which is that as a lot of great scholars, especially Mark Becker, um, I'm thinking of, have shown 
peasant struggles in the highlands also had an ethnic component and there was a lot of interweaving of class and ethnic identity. But the primary language was class and the primary sort of terrain of struggle was who owns the land. Land seen as an economic input and an economic um, relationship. In the Amazon, you have a very different situation. There was much more truncated to non-existent um, Spanish colonization uh, in, in Ecuador. I'm not saying that, that there was no colonization elsewhere in the Amazon, I'm speaking in Ecuador. Um, the, the moment that colonization of the Amazon really occurs is um, later post-independence in the 20th century under the sort of rubric of state-led, an independent state, you know, sovereign state, not, not, not under Spanish control anymore. So state-led um, colonization efforts, they're called, or settlement efforts. And it's not dissimilar to the settling of the Western frontier in the U.S. in the sense that it is state-funded, state-subsidized settlement that um, involves the displacement of indigenous peoples and the, the, the you know, violent, um, violent encounters with indigenous peoples. The difference is, you know, there's a, a one interesting difference is that there, there is um, Highland indigenous people are part of that resettlement. So that's where you get, you know, there's a lot of complexity, as you can see right there, where Highland indigenous folks move to, uh, because the state is basically offering almost free land to the Amazon and they encounter Amazonian indigenous people. And there's a lot of disagreements, you know, between different indigenous peoples that result from that. But mostly it's mestizos coming from the Highlands. Um, and so what, what this settlement project does is, is, is politicize immediately the question of territory and territorial control, which is a distinct question than one of like land distribution. What had existed prior to the 1960s in the Amazon was indigenous communities that were pretty intact, that had ethno-linguistic sort of coherence to them, and that were used to controlling large areas of territory, both for direct use, use for, for, um, for human settlement, for hunting, for fishing, for spiritual uses, and also had had you know, wars and battles between different um, Amazonian indigenous groups over the control of territory. And you know, basically what happened starting in the 70s due to this this official land uh, colonization project is that indigenous peoples in the Amazon start to organize themselves around the defense of territory. And this immediately is in response, not just to the state, but relatedly to extractive industries that are coming into the Amazon. It's first logging, then it's oil, then it's mining. So you have layers of territorial defense, territorial conflict and layers that are you know, in terms of cultural and intellectual and discursive development of coming up with ways to articulate that defense, to ground it in legal norms, um, to ground it in, in cultural history and in ancestral use. And so you have a quite different pattern of how people relate to the physical space and, and through that relate to the state and other economic elites. And I hope I've done that justice, but it, it ends up, and I'm not gonna get into it, read the book, you know, as they say, but you know, it ends up shaping the indigenous movement internally quite a bit in moments where there was more of a land focus and the highland people sort of dominated the indigenous movement more to a shift which my book covers where Amazonian indigenous peoples really became um, political leaders within the national movement and disseminated a, a discourse of territory more broadly. Thank you. Um, we're close to the end of the amount of time you said you could stay with us. We do have two really good questions. Um, sure, you can. You want to lay them both on me if they're not too long to say, and I can, you know, see if I can answer one or both of them. Yeah, uh, one is short, one is not short, okay. but they're both really great. I'll just give them to you, and then we can see. We'll see what's doable for you. So the first one is from Jenny Keel, who's actually a fellow at C Twenty One this year. And Jenny asks, um, do you think that the codification of environmental rights and resource rights in national constitutions is effective, impactful, or a mirage? And question two is from Casey Butler. Sorry, Casey Butcher. This has been such an interesting conversation, thanks. Have you encountered concepts in the region like quote unquote environmental justice and environmental sacrifice zones that emphasize the racist, classist, and imperialist distribution of negative impacts of petrocapitalism? Do affected communities in Ecuador, Bolivia, et cetera, deploy these concepts, which were elaborated by black communities in the US in the 70s and 80s? Um, thank you. I love both those questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna violate my own timeframe to, to speak to both of them briefly. Um, and hi, Casey. Um, 
dear comrade. Uh, I hope we get to hang out sometime again soon in Chile, maybe. Um, anyway, they let us travel again. So um, first question about the rights of nature and the codification of environmental rights in, in Ecuador. I want to just emphasize, because it sounds like the, the, speak, the, the question asker is knowledgeable about this, but to folks that aren't, Ecuador's constitution was the first to um, endow nature with with legal rights. Um, those legal rights aren't expected to be claimed by, by nature itself, but rather by sort of human allies to nature that can go into courtrooms and, and say that the rights of nature have been violated. Um, I had the privilege to, to witness one of the first major cases that hinged on the rights of nature when I was doing my field work um, over a, a mining project that I mentioned in the excerpt. Uh, activists brought forth a case that this that that this violates the rights of nature as described in the constitution and they lost that case um and so it's interesting because i think in some ways um and, and this even gets back to those thorny questions that geo was posing earlier about like who rules and who can make claims and on whose behalf um and how this is all mediated by these innovative constitutions that are extremely progressive constitutions in in Bolivia, Venezuela, and, and, and Ecuador. Um, and um, so, so in this case, human the human allies lost, right? They were unable to stop the mining project or to stall it. This mining project became Ecuador's first. It's now producing uh, copper and open pit mine um, in, in the zone where the Amazon um, meets the foothills of the Andes, one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. Um, and so, uh, in a we could say that the rights of nature framework hasn't been successful in in or in stopping extractive projects. However, I would complicate that briefly in two ways. One is I think, and this goes back to to the, our discussion of language and discourse. For me, um, codification is not the end all and be all, and court cases are not the end all and be all. What's interesting about documents, especially in these pink tide contexts like Ecuador's constitution is not whether or not activists could take them into court and win on them. Um, activists, you know, anywhere in the world are often on just extremely asymmetric terrain in the legal system for obvious reasons. But what was interesting to me was the way that activists took ownership, and I mean that quite literally, of the Constitution and deployed its language in all sorts of battles with the state and corporation and you know, felt a real sense of legal empowerment. And I think it's just hard to overemphasize this. I'm sure Gio Amer witnessed similar things in Venezuela. I witnessed this both in Bolivia and Ecuador, which is you know, ordinary people literally carrying around copies of the constitution and being ready to cite an article and knowing the numbers of article. And I mean, numbers like 392, right? Like not like number one or our 10 bill of rights, but like numbers that are long and, 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 and verbiage that is quite difficult, right? And so, you know, it, what was inspiring and fascinating to me was less whether the rights of nature could, you know, win a court case and more the sort of life that political activity breathed into the document and the ways that the document was used in ways that were unexpected or unintended by state actors. Um, and then the second way briefly that complicated is that since I did my field work, actually activists have won a number of cases on rights of nature grounds. So there's interesting research out there and I'm happy to um, you know, if the, whoever that was wants to email me, I can point it, point them towards it. Um, Casey, your question is a really good one. Um, and the answer is kind of simple, which is no. In my experience, I did not witness either the EJ environmental justice or sacrifice zone framing, as Casey rightly notes, these come out of black and brown working class communities in, in the US um, and also indigenous communities in the US that are subjected to extraordinary amounts of, of pollution and harm, especially around things like the petrochemical complex in Louisiana, in Houston, um, also around fracking. And so for decades, these communities have, have um, basically targeted the way in which they are sacrificed to the sort of altar of, of fossil development and, and do not at all benefit from it. And it's been a really powerful language and, and mobilizing strategy. And what's fascinating that Casey was also implicitly referencing is that as far away as, you know, from Houston or, or, or so-called Cancer Alley as Chile, in the Mapuche south of Chile, activists use this language as well. So it's a testament to the way that discourse travels, you know, across really wide distances and is deployed in, in a variety of, of, of struggles that in, in many ways are, are quite parallel to one another. Um, while I don't, I never observed these two frames being used in Ecuador, I will say that 
the discourse of extractivism has traveled much more broadly than I expected it to. So when I studied it in 2011, you know, started in 2011, or even in, in, in 2008, when I was mentioning I first moved to Ecuador, I would use this language and like, no one, not even, you know, environmental activists, whoever, they had no idea what I was talking about. It's like a totally new term. And now the language of extractivism is so known among sort of, you know, again, the global left that I have to actually often be very careful in exactly what I mean by it, what type of interlocutors I'm talking about, what the precise definitions that Latin Americans mean when they use it. Um, and so it's, an, it's, it's interesting. And the last thing I'll say is that my current project, which is on the extractive frontiers of, of the energy transition, specifically looking at lithium, or one of the places I'm looking at is lithium extraction in, in Chile, activists have come up with a new term, which is green extractivism. So it's the way in which like green energy and green technology involves new forms of sacrifice and dispossession in the global South, right? So they, they've turned this discourse, I don't want to say on its head, but deployed it in a totally new way, which is the sort of new frontiers of energy and technology. Thank you so much. This is so sharp and so interesting. I have learned so much from you in this very brief hour, a little bit longer. Um, one final thing um, I'll just throw in here. I know you have to go. Jim Johnson is saying, anyone in chat have any recommendations for a plea beginning to understand these ideas and histories? Where do you start? I will say that I threw the link to your book in the top of the chat. Please find it. It is 50% off right now um, at Duke. <laughs> so that's a good place to start. Um, and I just want to thank both of you so much for coming and for talking about these really important issues with us. I don't know, you can unmute and say any last words you'd like. Yeah, I just want also to thank you guys both. And uh, Thea, I had a couple of questions, which I'll get you in some other media form than this one. That was great, both of you. Thanks, Gio. Thanks, Thea. Thank you all for organizing it. It's great to see you all. Thank you. Likewise, everyone. It was really a pleasure. Okay, we'll end it there. We will see you next week. We are actually at a slightly different time next week for our Fall Friday series. We have a symposium on post-coloniality and film archiving, and that's from noon to four. So the details of that are up on our website and we hope to see you there.